Thanks a lot. Oh, I guess this is really good. Um, you know, things that, no matter how much you say things are going to get better, and they never, they never really do get better in this job, but um, I was reflecting on seeing people um, here today that I've known for many years. In fact, when I went to the tax department, one of my bosses at the tax department is here, um, E.J. McMahon, and um, people that I've worked with on and off for a big chunk of the time that I've been in Albany. As I was walking up here today, I was telling um, somebody that I uh, first moved to Albany in 1978 as what was back then called a Senate Fellow. And I did that. I worked in Senator Orenstein's office, who was the minority leader of the Senate at the time. And I don't know, I started to enjoy state government and state policy work that no one has been, you know, that, that mistake has continued for <laughs> a long, long time now. So, anyway, I did want to um, go through this presentation relatively quickly, and I tried to um, focus primarily on the outlook past the 11-12 um, budget year. I think one of the accomplishments of this budget that hasn't gotten as much attention as it deserves, and I do think it was a very good budget, and that has very little to do with the department, the division of the budget, and a lot to do with the willpower of the governor who's trying to get the budget done. And believe me, I've learned that lesson um, over the course of many years. So again, I think the other thing that and the thing I want to focus on today is the governor's view was, I don't just want to solve an 11-12 problem. I want to put us more on the road of, we don't have a $10 billion budget gap every year, even recognizing that we have very difficult fiscal issues that we're going to have to continue to confront year after year. How do we get past this cycle of living with these mammoth budget gaps from year to year? So, I think the real achievement of this budget was solving the 11-12 problem in such a way that it puts us on a path for, for I think, fiscal stability and, a, in the long run, a much better fiscal environment for the state. But um, let's go through it and see. Everyone knows some of these facts, so I'll go through them quickly, and I probably talked about them. Back in November, which seems like 12 years ago to me now, but um, New York budget gaps of $10 billion, but look at what the out-year gaps were. They were, you know, 15 billion, 17 billion, growing to over 20 billion. Those are, you know, mind-boggling. You know, when you read in the paper, California has a $26 billion budget deficit. You know, and we were looking at a $21 billion problem in fiscal 15, these are just numbers that, you know, are incomprehensible to a certain extent. You know, how do you kind of climb down from that, you know, deficit that you have? And so that's what we're going to talk about. We all know why we had the gaps, too. It was no secret. You know, we spend a lot in New York. Um, that's one thing for sure. But we also had a recession, which was a deadly recession nationwide. It was a very big recession. Actually, I'll show you a graph that shows that New York came out of that recession in fairly good shape economically. But what we did lose was a lot of income. And income produces tax revenue. And so we had huge declines in tax revenue by any historical <coughs> standard. And then we also had the fact that the feds had been providing significant fiscal um, support to the states on a limited, time-limited basis, and in the current fiscal year, that money goes away. So we were losing, the economy was very bad, you know, and is slowly recovering, which is good news, but still not recovering to the point where we were before. We were losing, so we had lost significant tax revenue. We we're losing significant um, fiscal support from the feds. And then the last piece was we had an income tax surcharge on high income individuals, which the governor, for policy reasons, felt he did not want to extend. So we were losing on the revenue side from another source as well. So we had significant budget gaps we had to fill. How are we going to do that, given all of these things that were going on? 
Well, <coughs> we'll get into more detail. We did it primarily on the spending side, almost entirely on the spending side of the budget. 85% of the $10 billion budget gap closing program <coughs> was reductions in spending. A big chunk of that was done on the to local assistance, but also significant cuts to state agency operations. And for those of you who work in state agencies, you know how deep the cuts were to state agencies and how um, what I spend most of my time on making sure that we achieve those cuts in the current fiscal <coughs> environment, which is very difficult. Um, we didn't really do any tax increases. There were some small revenue actions which really dealt more with tax modernization um, and improving the collection of taxes, but we did not increase any taxes. And outside of the smoothing that we did on our pension contribution, which some would characterize as a, as a borrowing, we really wouldn't, and that was a decision that was made really prior to this governor taking office, um, there was no borrowing. So um, that's kind of the 30,000 foot piece. We kind of took a very aggressive stand on spending. We extended that aggressive stand with some reforms, which I'll talk about, out into the future. And those reforms, if put in place, if we stick to them, if we're able to work within the constraints set by those reforms, we will significantly reduce the out here gaps. And you can see the estimate now is those gaps fall to 2.5, 2.8, and $4.6 billion compared to you know, 14, 17, and 21. So we've eliminated a significant portion of our structural deficit. I'll talk a little bit about the economics, because the economics drive so much, and this is about an outlook. So where are we headed? And you know, we think the economy's recovered. These are national indices that our economists look at all the time. And you can see you know, on the income side and on the employment side, there's been growth, but it's been pretty slow, and we're nowhere near back to where the cyclical peaks were. The purple lines, or whatever color that is, the vertical, um, represent recessions at the national level. And you can see, however, more on the real side of the economy that sales and industrial production have begun to increase pretty significantly. So the national economy is doing a little better. And so we project that that will continue out into the future. This is our forecast of GDP and inflation out into the future. It's very consistent with what private sector economists are saying. I think we're pretty much in the middle of the pack. So inflation remains relatively under control, and growth is in the neighborhood of 2 to 3.5%, which is about trend growth in the economy. So the economy is recovered, and we get some slow, you know, moderate growth. If you look compared to the late 90s, we would say growth in the economy will be below that, but kind of constant moderate growth as the economy continues to recover. People talk about a jobless recovery, but if you look at it, I mean, we put this graph in there because we don't think the situation we're in now is that unusual. If you look at older recessions, which are those kind of top three lines, as you kind of, the economy moved out of recession, employment situation would improve dramatically. For the last three national recessions, that hasn't happened. And I think a lot of people believe it's because the structure and nature of the economy has changed. We're more of a service-oriented economy, less a manufacturing economy, manufacturing employment much more subject to cyclical swings. So you can see our recovery, which is the red line here from this recession, is really no different than the past two. And you know, we're a little bit positive. Corporations are in a pretty good spot right now. Profits are up. And so we think corporate spending will increase and investment will increase. And that will be one of the things that increases economic growth over the near term. But this is what I really want to talk about. It's confusing looking, I know. Um, it's not on purpose, really. <laughs> um, this is odd. 
um, and index the division of the budget puts together on where we think the state economy is. And if you look at it, the browner sections, these kind of, this kind of stuff, represents what we think is a state recession as opposed to a national recession. You can see the national recessions are superimposed over the brown um, bars. So you can see in past recessions, the New York, especially the past two, which many of us in this room in state government and local government have lived through. I'm thinking Don, especially that 90s, early 90s recession, which was uh, torturous. The state went into recession way before the national government and came out way after. I think in that recession, the state lost over 500,000 jobs. So that was a, you know, and the national recession, by comparison, was relatively modest. You can see, even after 9-11 and the recession that followed that, we, we tended, for obvious reasons, to stay in that recession significantly longer. We would have expected the same this time around, given the financial crisis and the nature of what led to this recession. But in fact, we think we went into recession actually a little bit after the national economy as a whole and came out of it a little after, but not you know, significant not anything in comparison to past history. So we think we've done a little bit better, at least the real part of the economy. If you look at employment, if you look at unemployment, the state is doing better than the national economy. So that's a positive. Again, we're forecasting that continues into the future, but at a relatively modest pace, at consistent with how the state economy has grown on the upside of the cycle but it's a little positive news. But it wasn't the news that was affecting revenue. The news that was affecting revenue was really not captured here, and that's the kind of taxable elements <coughs> of income that really plummeted. But I think we'll get to that. I'm, I'm spending too much on the economy, I know, but I think it sets the tone for something when you say, where are we going? And if you look at this chart, I think this is one our economists particularly like, because it shows that the economy is not just one dimensional. It's a very dynamic kind of organism. And so we think of ourselves as purely a financial services sector kind of economy, but I don't think that's really accurate. But what this is showing is that dark, kind of heavy black line shows job losses or at, firm, at the firm level or the closing of a firm, so the death of a firm plus loss of jobs. And the red line at the firm level, the thinner line, shows expansions of, so firms that are adding jobs or starting from scratch. And so you can see when you look at that, even in the worst of times, like the last two recessions, 15 to 20 percent of firms are adding jobs. The problem is you have 20 or 25 percent of firms that are getting rid of jobs. So you always have this dynamic element in the economy of firms that are adding and firms that are shedding jobs, and it's really the net that determines how, how badly you're doing, and the purple bars show the kind of net impact. So when you're above that kind of horizontal line, the, the economy's employment is expanding. So anyway, we, we do have a pretty diverse and dynamic economy. But this is all people want to talk about, which is um, how much we raise in terms of bonuses, for example, from the financial services sector. Why? Because they pay a lot of the bills. Um, you know, financial service sector bonuses, which were over, you know, when you look here, it's in here, over $50 billion, that's over $50 billion of income that's being taxed at the highest rate. So that's generating a lot of income for the state. That dropped off with the financial crisis and is only now recovering. But in fact, it's recovering a little bit faster than we expected it to. And so we actually had a fairly good year this year on the bonus side. I talk as if I was getting one of them, but we only <laughs> We only get the aftermath. Um, 
And you can see overall wages actually were declining um, for, for two years in New York, which is very unusual for non-inflation adjusted wages to actually decline. And a lot of that was because the bonus situation was so bad. But we expect it to recover. But again, we're not going to get back to where we were um, you know, prior to the financial collapse. The bigger loss of revenue was in capital gains, reported on taxable returns, which doesn't show up in any economic series. So this is something we were at over $100 billion in taxable income showing up as capital gains. And that income um, kind of fell off the table for two years in a row. I probably talk about this in November. But the good news is that it's kind of, we don't really know what it was in 2010, but we know that it was pretty good from looking at returns that have been filed. So our estimate now is that we had significant growth in capital gains. Nothing like getting us back to where we were, but a significant recovery, which now we think with modest growth gets us a little bit higher in, in future years. So again, a better situation than we were talking about in November. And the results um, for 2010 have been pretty good so far. And why would that be? Well, again, when you're thinking about the state's system and how we kind of grow, I think it's good. This is a chart that I think is important to look at. The blue dotted line, which looks pretty volatile, right? It goes up and down. That's reported income. That's an economic series reported by the Bureau of Economic Analysis for New York. But those other two lines, the black line and the red line, represent what's reported on New York tax returns as income, New York AGI, and then what the income tax liability is. And these are growth rates. So you can see that income reported on returns and liability are much more volatile than any series that's reported. And that's because you have things like capital gains and business income, which is recorded in different ways. And also because we have somewhat of a progressive system, though some people don't think so. We have somewhat of a progressive tax system, so liability tends to react more than increases in income. So liability goes down more in recessions and goes up faster when the economies recover. That's typical of the cycle, so hopefully we're in an up phase now where we're going to be doing better, and that's something to be at least a little optimistic about. I'm going to run quickly through these and talk about this, because this is kind of what we were here to discuss, the outlook going forward. So you take all of that economics and you put it together, and you kind of get that blue line on the bottom, which is how much resources grow by. So how much tax revenue and miscellaneous receipts and fee revenue is growing by. And had we done nothing in the budget, the red dotted line on the top is where we thought spending was going. This is on a state operating funds basis. So you can see, we call this the JAWS chart, <laughs> and you can see why we call it that. Um, and you can see there were significant gaps between resource and what we were going to spend or if we had done nothing in the budget. The solid red line is where we think we ended up. And so we think the important story is not just that we balanced 11-12, but that we brought that gap down significantly in the out years and the question is how did we do that? Well, we cut spending a lot. Um, and you can see on this table, this is kind of a tabular form of the chart we just went through. Um, we eliminated a $10 billion problem, well, primarily by cutting spending, aid to locality spending by $7 billion. Um, state agency spending by a billion four. Now, why state agency so much less than local assistance? Because we spend so much more on local assistance. And I'll show you that in a chart in a second. But the key to this chart is really how those things extend out into the future. So you can see that the local assistance cuts grow into the future. We took a lot of growth out of our two fastest growing programs. 
our two fastest growing programs, and no surprise to anyone here, it's aid to schools and health care. And so by putting controls in place to kind of cut the growth out of those areas is how we are trying to keep those out of your gaps down to a reasonable level. And again, the agency cuts are very significant. We're talking about 10% year-to-year reductions, not off of base, but off of what was spent last year at the agency level, which are significant cuts to agencies. Um, but where were those cuts? And this is just kind of confirming what I just said. School aid and Medicaid kind of were the equal um, local assistance pillars where we cut a significant amount on a base, you know, basis of that 10 billion, 2.7 was in Medicaid and 2.7 was in school aid. Then you can see the amount that was in about 16% of the total was in state agency cuts that we talked about. The other cuts, um, for people who feel the pain of the other cuts, it's probably unfortunate to just say other, but that's mainly other cuts to local assistance programs and cuts to um, programs like the AIM program, which was aid to municipalities. And then a relatively small share of non-recurring Again, we didn't want to do a lot of non-recurring actions because the idea was not only to eliminate the current gap, but to try to eliminate the out-year gaps. And these, all of the other things we've talked about have an out-year value for obviously non-recurring. Use of non-recurring resources only benefits you once. And then again, relatively small amount of, um, relatively small amount of revenue. Um, healthcare. What did we do that allows us to get those gaps down? Well, several things, and I think innovative things that hopefully will help us out into the future. We cut a significant amount, but what did we do? Well, the governor convened what was called the Medicaid Redesign Task Force. As a revenue person, I always want to call MRT the mortgage recording tax, mm -hmm. but it is the Medicaid Redesign Task Force. And he put together folks from um, all interested parties, uh, folks representing the hospitals, folks representing the unions, people representing the nursing home industry, people representing the consumers, people, um, his commissioners in the health-related field, and Jason Helgerstein, who's the um, person the governor brought in from Wisconsin who managed the Wisconsin Medicaid program to help kind of manage this Medicaid redesign task force. So what did they do? I mean, I think a lot of people felt it was not a process that was going to work or produce fruitful results. I think the governor was determined that it was and got buy-in from the participants early on. And one of the ways he got by and was to tell them, you know, your target's like $2.8 billion. So we're not talking about coming back to us with um, actions that really aren't going to hit, you know, that number. We really need some serious ways of reducing spending. And so the task force came back with several things which we kind of rolled into the budget. And I think we did it in kind of a unique way. One was a billion dollars worth of just reforms. And I'm no healthcare expert, but I know you guys do a lot of healthcare kind of um, discussions up here at Rockefeller. I, I really do think if you could get Jason up here to talk you through the reforms, it would be an interesting discussion. Um, and Jim Intro. But the billion is mainly moving folks, a big chunk of that is mainly moving folks who are in fee-for-service programs into managed care programs. And I could go into a lot of detail about that, but, you know, if that's kind of the main focus of the reform, not the only reform, but it was the main focus, and it included things like home care and personal care, which were rapidly growing, are our most rapidly growing parts of the Medicaid program. 
than more traditionally, you know, 350 million roughly and across the board reduction, which the industry decided to take on their own. And then another $185 million, again, relatively traditional of cuts from trends that are built into statute that they're supposed to get. So that package was worth a significant amount of money, but then what the industry basically came back and said is, you know, what you do too often to us is you try to prescribe the way we're going to get savings and you cut, you know, provider rates to ensure that you get those savings. What the industry in large part came back and said is for that $640 million, we'll get the savings on our own because we'll find the areas where we can economize and it won't be the same for every hospital, it won't be the same for every nursing home, it won't be the same for every sector, but we have the ability to figure that out. People like me never think that's a good idea. Um, but what they did to make that work is, and they said, okay, and if we don't, you have the ability, without going back to the legislature, to take administrative actions to get that $640 million. That's a very unusual power in New York State. However, not an unusual power in other states. Um, Wisconsin, for example, where Jason came from, probably had the ability administratively, the executive, to get that $640 million. So we're taking a similar action in New York. On top of that, we're capping spending at $15.3 billion. And then to make sure that all of this holds together in the out years, we did a two-year appropriation in Medicaid, which is, I think, the first time we've ever done that. We have the ability constitutionally to do two-year appropriations in certain instances. We used that authority and said, we're not going to grow Medicaid spending next year by any more than 4%, which is the 10-year average of CPI, the medical component of CPI. And we're going to put in a second-year appropriation of 15.9 and do all of these same things, including giving the executive the power to go in and find those actions he needs to get to stay within the target. Beyond that, we put in law and statute, but not in appropriation. Both of those, we call them superpowers. <laughs> that we could probably come up with a better term for that. Um, that superpowers in appropriation language, so really that will be there for two years. And then we have, in regular statutory language, a, a cap that says that out year spending cannot in healthcare cannot increase by any more than the 10 year rolling average of the medical component of CPI, which is about 4%. Um, so this is a lot of pieces that got put together. How are we going to do the, if the 640 isn't reached, what are we going to do? Oh, we're putting up a website for all, I think within the next week or two, that website's going to say, this is how much we said we were going to spend in April. This is how much we spent. We have to go out and um, take actions to make sure we hit that 640, then we're going to go do that. We're working closely with Washington, with CMS, which is um, you know, the kind of Medicaid administrator, um, and to make sure that they're OK with this process. They're very interested in this process. They want us to see if it works because it may be a model for other states. And so we are working closely with them to make sure that when we go in and need to make changes to, to make sure we get to these savings, that they are um, on board and facilitate those changes so we don't have to sit around waiting. Also, we're working, the Medicaid Redesign Task Force did not go away. They continue to operate. So when and if we have to use the superpowers, we would go back to the task force and we would obviously look at issues like regional issues and industry issues to decide where we should take actions or institute reforms to make sure we're hitting the cap. But um, I think, you know, a pretty interesting approach which we think um, has a lot of value for the future and will keep healthcare costs under control.
so we're in the process of continuing to work on that. And I know I'm going on too long. School aid is very similar, less complicated, but pretty similar. A significant reduction to school aid in the current year, a year-to-year -year reduction of about 6.1% on a school year-to-school -school year basis. But again, we didn't want to address one year. So again, we did a two-year appropriation. The second year is fixed in law. We grew it by growth in personal income because we wanted to signal to school districts that we weren't going to continually starve them of school aid, especially as the economy begins to recover. But we were going to take out of schools a large, large, you know, increases that were embedded in current law. So that's the second year. And then like health care, we have a permanent statute which says that school aid will not grow more than the growth in state personal income, which has averaged over the past five, ten years, depending on how you look at it, somewhere between four and four and a half percent. And you can see based on our estimates, Next year, which is already fixed in law, grows by $800 million. And the two out years are estimates of personal income growth. So we believe significant growth in out year school aid, but still significantly below what was in prior law, or what is in prior law if these caps don't hold. And so we're very much focused on, again, this is not the end of the school aid story. What has to happen with school aid now still is kind of how do we turn these kind of growth restrictions, which we don't think are um, particularly serious. I mean, personal income growth, we think over the long haul would be a pretty good way to, to grow school finance. Um, how do we do that to be consistent with things that are out there like the um, <coughs> foundation aid and things like that. So there's more work to be done on education. But again, the same approach was taken, a two-year approach and a cap on how year growth based on personal income. We already talked about agency spending. Again, we're trying to do that. I think um, the 10% year-to-year growth. The other piece to think about that this governor is very, very interested in is the SAGE Commission, which is a commission to consolidate and eliminate wasteful parts of state government. You know, we have over, I don't know, I would lose count, 67 or 68 state agencies in New York State, multiple additional commissions. And I think there's an attempt here to try to consolidate that down, so not to eliminate services, but to make service delivery better and to kind of economize where we need to economize. Remember, this is a state with three mental health agencies and a health department, which doesn't deal with mental health issues. In most states, that's one agency. So we can't make a transition to do something radical like one health agency tomorrow. The governor knows that, and maybe that's not even the right choice. So that's what the SAGE Commission is working on, to think through where maybe we should be consolidating and eliminating. And the goal is to eliminate at least 20% of the state agencies. And again, I think if you looked at a list of state agencies rather than reacting to the 20%, you could probably go through that list and say, yeah, that's probably something we should think about doing. Um, this is an interesting one. This kind of shows what we expect out year growth to be by what we spend our money on. Um, so again, this is kind of total. So we're keeping our spending in the out years down to below, you know, in the range of four to below four percent. So we think in saying to schools, for example, that our aid is going to grow by maybe more than that. We're going to stay within that confine ourselves, and certainly on the healthcare side, we're going to stay within that confines in our total spending. So 
and that's even given the fact that we have fixed costs as well as locals and schools. We understand that, which are growing much faster. So you can see debt service, for example, and fringe benefits, which includes our pension contribution for employees as well as health care contribution for our employees and our retired employees. Those are growing at much more rapid rates um, than what we are going to grow overall by. So we're going to continue to be in the position of having to economize at the state agency and state level. But again, I think it's the governor's firm belief that we have got to have a multi-year look at how we grow government. We have to do it in an intelligent way, and we have to put resources where we need the most in the most efficient way. So. We think this budget was a great start to that. And I think that's really it. There are risks all the time. There are risks, of course. The economy is the most important risk. And implementation, which is what I spend all, excuse me, all my time doing now, is, is also, a, especially with health care, um, and all of the complications associated with the MRT, making sure that works, is what we're focused on now. And then the others are the typical kinds of things. We think this budget fundamentally changed the way we think about budgets in New York by focusing on not just one year, but multiple years. By trying to put in, though by no means finished with the job, constraints, reasonable constraints on how government grows in the out years at the state level. At the same time, providing health care providers, school districts with some knowledge about what they can expect from the state on a reasonable level over the next several years. If we're able to accomplish this, I think, and the economy does a little better than we expect, which would be great, I think you know, for the first time in a long time, New York is actually staring structural balance right in the face. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of the outlook for the future, I think. Thank you.